Tonight, I'd like to introduce Dr. Shiloh Felton, who is a coastal avian ecologist and a field manager for National Audubon Society's Clean Energy Initiative. And there she helps to engage Audubon members in respons responsibly cited and clean operated energy projects. And uh, she has worked on avian restorations projects in both the Atlantic and Pacific coasts for over 20 years, including a remote uh, work on common and roseate tern colonies off the coast of Cape Cod, Massachusetts. And she's also worked on loggerhead shrike recovery projects on St. Clementine Island in California. Her PhD in fisheries, wildlife and conservation biology is from North Carolina State University, where she served as a climate science fellow for the USGS Southeast Climate Adaptation Science Center. She brings her experience in avian ecology, animal behavior, experimental design and population modeling to inform her engagement in or offshore wind development. So Dr. Shiloh is going to talk to us tonight about how responsible offshore wind projects can protect birds and the places they live and how we can take action too. So please welcome Dr. Shiloh Felton. Well, thank you so much for that, Jennifer. That was a really warm welcome. I wanna thank you and Joelle and everyone here at Orleans Audubon Society for inviting me um, to speak this evening and giving me the opportunity to chat with you tonight. Uh, that was a very warm welcome, so I hardly need to <laughs> introduce myself further, but uh, just a couple of photos uh, to make it clear that I actually do have this avian background and I come from this um, conservation background and perspective. Um, this is on the left is me at on San Clemente Island. I used to work for San Diego Zoo, uh, their research institute early in my career and they have a captive um, population um, for breeding of loggerhead shrikes. Um, so that's us fixing a foot of a San Clemente loggerhead shrike. Um, and then the other photo is proof of me on a common, on a common turn colony. Um, if you couldn't see the birds, you could at least see the poop that's scattered all over my shirt and shorts there because that's really one of their defense mechanisms. They're like little uh, fighter pilots. Um, and then uh, at, at NC State, I worked heavily with um, the National Park Service there and, and looked at um, impacts from off-road vehicles and predator management um, practices for American oyster catchers. And in fact, um, I had the opportunity of visiting Grand Isle for an American oyster catcher working group meeting um, back in 2018. Uh, and I do have the koozie to prove it. So, uh, <laughs> so I've, I've had a wonderful time in Louisiana and, um, and done a lot of great work with some folks down in Louisiana on loggerhead or on uh, American oyster catcher. Um, I am part of a team that works to address inter the intersection of avian conservation and utility scale renewable energy development. Uh, we work on policies, planning and practices and specific projects in order to meet our clean energy needs while reducing impacts to birds and their habitats. Um, Gary George is the director of our clean energy initiative. Um, and then John Belak is my partner who takes care of um, the Central and Pacific flyways and works on solar and wind projects there. And then I take care of all of offshore wind and uh, solar and wind projects on the Atlantic and Mississippi flyways. We work closely with um, the industry, government agencies, partners, and our network, that's you, <laughs> um, to support, expedite, and expand the development of clean energy uh, policies and planning practices. Um, and projects that we think are responsibly cited and operated in order to meet our clean energy goals. We know, as I'm sure you know, that climate change is a bird issue. Audubon's climate report documents the predicted range loss of 389 species if we fail to address climate change. So that's really what brings us here today. Um, and you can find our climate report, um, if you haven't seen that, 300, um, 
survival by degrees at climate.audubon.org. This um, image here is for is plotting global warming project projections under different emission scenarios. That red line depicts the worst case scenario if we continue to grow our greenhouse gas emissions at the rate we currently do. The blue line is the ideal scenario in which we significantly reduce our greenhouse gas emissions. And then that yellow line you can just forget about. That was the prediction of global surface temperatures if we magically stopped emitting carbon back in 2020. So regardless of, um, of whether we take action as we should, we're still gonna be seeing a, an increase in global surface temperatures just because there's this delayed effect. So when it, once we turn it off, it's still gonna keep warming for just a little bit longer. Cerulean warblers are one example of the species that are covered by our um, survival by degrees report. This map here is the current range for cerulean warbler. This is the um, range predicted under um, a global warming scenario of 1.5 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels. And it's pretty likely that even if we take action today, we will still see this. Uh, the red areas are parts where the range is lost. Um, blue is where range is gained. Yellow is where range is maintained. This map here shows that if we continue to fail to take action, we're predicted to reach 3.0 degrees Celsius increased warming scenario by 2080, at which point very little of the current range remains. And there's you know, a bit of a range shift north, but that basically takes this bird entirely out of the United States. So we need to act to mitigate these effects, but we also need to acknowledge that climate change is going to continue to affect these species moving forward. And therefore it's also essential that we limit any pressures on these populations that are in addition to climate change. And living in Louisiana, you know firsthand that there are direct impacts to birds from fossil fuels beyond just a changing climate. So these are photos from the response and cleanup to the BP oil spill, the Deepwater Horizon oil spill. And you can see our energy consumption, while it's slowed, has continued to increase, which leads to more greenhouse gas emissions. And we gotta keep in mind that even as we start converting to using more electricity, you know, electric cars, for example, we're still contributing to fossil fuels and greenhouse gas emissions if the sources of that electricity are coming from non-renewable sources. In 2020, 80% of our energy came from non-renewable sources. So we really need to increase our generation of wind and solar in order to achieve our clean energy goals. We'll likely need to increase our wind capacity three to five times current levels in order to meet our energy needs and reduce the chances of reaching a 1.5 degree warming scenario or worse. For the current administration, federally, that transition is going to rely in large part on deploying 30 gigawatts of offshore wind by 2030. I bring this map here just to show um, the current wind resources in the United States. The darker colors are indicative of higher wind speeds um, in what would be considered the rotor swept zone for uh, a turbine. And if you look at the Gulf of Mexico, you'll see that the colors are a little bit lighter than say they are in other parts of the um, offshore United States. But if you compare it to the wind resources in Louisiana, you can see that offshore wind is going to be a big part of bringing renewable resources to Louisiana. So with that in mind, Audubon supports offshore wind energy and transmission that is sited and operated properly to avoid, minimize, and mitigate effectively for the impacts on birds, other wildlife, and the places they need. So what does that mean, right? Like, so, so far, I've just been talking about, you know, our policy and the effects from climate change. Um, and generating this offshore wind energy is a necessity to help us save our birds from the catastrophic losses of climate change. But we also wanna make sure that we're ensuring a future for birds that's worth saving, 
So we want to mitigate other potential population stressors that birds are um, that birds are dealing with so that they can more effectively cope with the effects of climate change. And that includes, among many other things, reducing potential impacts from clean energy. Oops, where did I go? There we are. Um, when we're considering these impacts, we're looking at both direct and indirect impacts related to collision um, and displacement. So, um, Direct impacts, obviously just um, birds accidentally hitting turbines. Um, and that can happen from birds that spend a great deal of time in the offshore wind environment. Um, and then that could happen also from birds that are migrating over um, wind areas. There's less chance of that happening because most of these migratory birds are, are um, flying above the rotor swept zone, but there are still chances of that occurring, right? There's still a, a, a risk, even if it's small. Um, and we, can, we also know that those risks can be amplified if they're attracted to the turbines um, or vessels that are constructing the turbines. Um, when we talk about displacement, we're talking about birds that really are foraging or um, spending a great deal of time near um, offshore wind um, projects. So um, pelicans that may be foraging in the area, for example, or, um, or birds like um, different, different gulls, right, or uh, black cat petrel, right. If there are birds that are spending a great deal of time offshore, we want to make sure we're not putting projects in areas where they would be foraging or spending a great deal of time foraging, not only because it increases their collision risk, but it also increases the chances that we're taking important habitat away from them. Because a lot of birds actually smartly sort of avoid um, wind turbine develop developments. And we know this from the offshore projects that have happened in Europe. We also pay particular attention to threatened and endangered species, obviously, like black cat petrel. I'll mention them a little bit more in, in later in the presentation, but we pay very close attention to those birds that are um, endangered or are um, just in, in particular have life history strategies that put them in contact or make them more vulnerable to offshore wind energy. Uh, there are specific concerns for plunging and diving birds. So um, some birds that are spending a lot of time underwater or, uh, or foraging for fish underwater um, could be impacted by noise created both by the turbines, but also just by extra noise created from vessel traffic from maintaining and, um, and building the turbine projects. Um, and then even in the Gulf of Mexico, where it's a little shallower, they haven't taken the idea of floating wind off the table. And while we don't really worry with um, floating wind cables, we, we don't worry about direct more, um, issues with entanglement with the actual cables because they're actually very large. You'll see this picture, there's all these like, you know, pieces to keep the floating turbine in place. But those are big cables, you know, like a foot in diameter or something. So um, we're more worried about potential secondary um, entanglement with ghost fishing gear. Boat and aerial surveys conducted before and after construction are some of the best ways that we can help reduce impacts from offshore wind energy because we can characterize what areas of the offshore wind environment or the offshore environment are heavily used by birds that we're concerned about. Um, and there has been, uh, there have been efforts that are funded by the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management, which uh, are working to characterize bird uh, distributions in the Gulf of Mexico. It's called GOMAPS. That's the shorthand version of it. This is the version that they did. This is AMAPS. So this is what they, this, these are the maps that they created from similar um, efforts in the Atlantic. And areas that are brighter yellow color show areas that are more heavily used by Northern Gannet. Um, you can see areas um, off the coast of 
North Carolina, you know, right by Cape Hatteras are exceptionally bright because they're just very important for, for Northern Gannett. Um, unfortunately, um, the report from all these GOMAP surveys that happened several years ago have not yet been published. So we've been really pushing um, Bureau of Ocean Energy Management and U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service to finish those reports and publish the results of those data so that it can be used to inform where projects are going. Um, this map that you see from um, Pat Jodis's lab out of um, University of um, out of Clemson University in South Carolina um, came in large part from those GOMAP surveys. Um, so they recently published this work looking at the range of black cat petrel within the Gulf of Mexico. So they've published some of the results. So we know they've actually got them ready. You know, they just need to finish them up and get them out there and actually be able to use them in, um, in deploying offshore wind and making decisions in deploying offshore wind in the Gulf of Mexico. There are also a couple of studies underway in Northern California um, that are intended to help inform what we call collision risk models. So this is how the service um, and, and Bureau of Ocean Energy Management calculates risk for certain projects. Um, we take information that we know about avian habits and, and um, behavior and use a model that helps us understand what the risk to birds is from a particular project in a particular area for particular birds. And when you combine that with the maps I showed you, you can get sort of a, a visual of which areas we need to be most concerned about. Um, the new collision risk models that are being um, made out of the SHOTS Institute in Northern California are supposed to bring in some more three-dimensional pieces of information that incorporate flight behavior for birds like albatross and shearwater, you know, birds that have a much uh, more dynamic flying behavior. Um, so that'll be very helpful, but that's still just looking at collision risk. Right, it's still not telling us what the actual dangers are. Those are still just predictions um, or hypotheses. And so it's not really helping us to understand what the true impacts to birds end up being. Um, and so we're also really pushing the agency to incorporate um, collision detection um, as part of its regulatory process as uh, an essential piece of monitoring for projects. Um, and while I realize this is something that comes in after a project is already built, um, it's still a very important piece. So we want to make sure that we're informing um, siting decisions but we also want to make sure that we're holding, um, that, that we reduce risk in, this, in the siting decisions, but that we're holding um, companies and agencies accountable for when um, take ends up being more than we would have expected, right? Or just in general, if there is, is some level of take, we want to document what that is so that we can hold companies accountable and so that we can employ um, appropriate mitigation and conservation um, outcomes. Um, and in the Gulf of Mexico, this becomes um, exceptionally important, not just for birds that reside regularly in the Gulf of Mexico, but also for birds that are um, migrating through. So we know that um, the Gulf of Mexico is a very important area for transit for transoceanic migrants. So a lot of our passerines and other land bird migrants use the Gulf of Mexico as sort of this migration highway. Um, so we need to have a better understanding of how birds are migrating across the Gulf of Mexico so that we can reduce risks. One of the great things that we have learned in the Gulf of Mexico from oil and gas um, is that birds are, like these are attracted to 
um, lit platforms. So this has really helped us to understand how we can reduce risk in offshore wind developments by reducing lighting. Um, the turbines are often required to um, comply with FAA regulations, but they can have um, specific lighting requirement or lighting um, situations where they where the lighting only turns on as a plane is approaching and the lighting stays off otherwise. And so that's been a requirement that we've been pushing for and has been employed in um, the um, record of decisions and in the permits for the two projects that have been approved up in uh, the New England waters offshore. So Vineyard Wind, the first Vineyard Wind One, the first offshore wind project, um, utility scale offshore wind project um, approved in federal waters is required to maintain this kind of lighting scheme where they're only putting light on as uh, planes approach. <clears throat> and that'll help to limit attraction to the turbines and to the uh, other platforms that are associated um, with the power stations. Other ways that we learn about um, birds in the offshore environment is through tagging. Um, so this is a MODIS tower. I don't know if anybody has, has seen these before. Um, uh, this one happens to be in a, down in Mexico, actually, <laughs> in Sinaloa, this particular um, telemetry tower. Um, but these will pick up on very small tags. Um, and we've deployed these tags. Uh, our researchers in the Migratory Bird Initiative have deployed these tags. Um, on black pole warbler, for example. So we know a lot about black pole warbler migration because of tags like this. They're very small. They can be fitted on birds that are five grams. Um, and, and we uh, have actually um, now gotten in the New York bite that there is a requirement for um, leases within the New York bite to have meteorological, if I could say it, meteorological buoys within their um, offshore wind lease before they deploy turbines with these receivers on them. So one of the troubles that we have in the offshore environment is that, you know, we can put large tags on birds that are satellite tags that can track bird, like large body birds out in the middle of the ocean. But if we're just using these little tiny tags that can go on smaller birds, those towers that receive the um, signals from the tags have to be out in the middle of the ocean in order to catch that kind of movement out in the ocean. Um, and so uh, getting these towers out into the ocean has been a bit of a struggle. So this win in, uh, in the New York bite, getting these meteor, meteor, getting these towers out in the offshore wind areas before turbines go in the water is really big and it's going to help us to understand how bird movement, um, it'll help us to characterize bird movement, but it'll also help us to characterize how bird movement changes as we build projects out. Radar is also um, an incredible tool that we're using to help understand bird movements. And this is great for large bursts of migratory movement. Um, and this can help us to make predictions. It can also help us to make um, potential adaptive management solutions. You know, if we see that there's a large burst of migratory movement, perhaps the right solution would be to um, turn off the turbines for a very short period of time. One of the problems brought up with this solution is that a lot of migratory passerines, um, you know, just run into things in the middle, you know, we, they run into buildings. Um, so even if the turbines are turned off, it doesn't necessarily limit their, their potential risk. Um, and so there's more research that we need to do to make sure that this is actually going to be um, a legitimate mitigation measure. And it might just be that the light, keeping the lighting off is the better, the better measure. Um, but nevertheless, this is helping us to understand when risks might be greatest. We also want to consider onshore um, 
aspects of the project. So cables still have to come on shore. Um, and the entire coastline of Louisiana is an important bird area, right? You guys are swimming, if you will, in important bird areas. It is a, it's just a, it's a wonderful coastline for all of the reasons that you know about. Um, and it is really important as a rookery for a lot of water bird species. Um, obviously the American oyster catchers are one of my favorite, um, uh, but I'm really more con concerned about pelicans, which in the Atlantic coast are not such a big deal because they hug the shoreline. Um, but in the, in the Gulf of Mexico, they're transiting across the, um, the Gulf and they fly at a, at a height that puts them at increased risk. And they're, you know, they're cool, but they're not the most delicate flyers, right? So they're not exactly quick to respond if, um, if they were to see something up ahead. Um, so this will be one of the birds that we're gonna be um, making sure that uh, brown pelicans and white pelicans, we're gonna be making sure that the service is, and that BOEM is particularly concerned with these and putting measures in place to um, keep them out of harm's way as best as possible. Um, the other thing that we've been working with the service on is making sure that um, horizontal directional drilling is used um, because we're not only worried about how it impacts birds as they come into the um, offshore environment, but we're, we're worried about how construction activities might impact important bird areas along the coastline. Um, some of these impacts can be avoided um, with with seasonal, you know, just timing of construction. But in the Gulf of Mexico, that's less helpful because birds are using your coastline year round. It just depends on what time of year we're in, um, which birds those are. Um, so we need to be very careful about which sites are chosen for onshore activity. Um, it's, there will be cables, if, if offshore wind is successful, there will be cables coming on shore. So we just be, need to be very mindful and advocate um, with, and work with the agency to find places that would be least impactful and, and practices that could be least impactful so that um, we can help support a renewable energy transition. So given these potential risks that we consider, Audubon works with our partners to advocate to site wind that minimizes impacts to birds. And we promote science to better understand what these impacts might be. And in that way, we're better able to adaptively manage our offshore wind projects as they're built. So what we learn from vineyard wind will help inform how we um, proceed with the Gulf of Mexico, even though they're different regions they'll help us to identify birds that might be certain at risk from certain, um, you know, from either displacement or collision. So um, just to sort of give a little bit of an oversight of how we kind of deal with this process, we're certainly going with a planning um, with identifying um, areas for offshore wind energy that minimize and avoid the worst impacts to birds. Um, but then we also work on things with timing of construction, um, with vessel traffic, um, and with, with cable lay laying in order to avoid impacts and minimize impacts during construction. And then with operation of the turbines, we're obviously thinking about decreased lighting schemes, we also think about perching. So pelicans, cormorants, birds like that tend to like to perch on the, um, on the tower, um, on, the, on the turbine platforms. And so reducing those perching opportunities can help reduce the attractiveness of those areas and reduce the um, potential for collision risk. Some of the ways that I've been involved personally in this process is through, um, NYSERDA's planning, they have a, um, an e-twig, which, uh, so it's called the Environmental Technical Work Group. Um, and that's not unique to the state of New York to have a technical work group like that, but I sit on the one in New York. I also sit on a, a technical advisory group in Maine. 
Um, and uh, we're pushing for these technical advisory groups in other states, like in um, the state of North Carolina. So we're working really hard with the governor's office to try and get a little bit more, um, you know, advice to advice to the state from experts in their planning process and their decision making process around offshore wind. Um, I work in coalition with National Wildlife Federation, with NRDC, with Defenders of Wildlife. Um, and we have these coalitions across the United States in different areas. I also sit on the um, Gulf of Maine um, Avian Monitoring Network um, on their Renewable Energy uh, Task Force to help just scientists in the region um, to uh, contemplate solutions and ways of working with the state and federal agencies to best guide this process as we move forward in the Gulf of Mexico. Um, and my boss sits on uh, the board of the American Wind and Wildlife Found um, Institute, excuse me, for um, to help guide that institute in where it directs its funding for research on, uh, on wind, and that includes offshore wind. Um, I do want to point out the um, New York State's Environmental Technical Working Group one more time, just because it is, uh, it's kind of a big deal. Uh, they're responsible for, um, for creating the State of the Science Workshop, which is a really cool workshop. I, and anybody's welcome to attend. They hold it annually. They're planning it right now. Um, and it's a really cool way to learn about um, the science around um, environmental concerns and wildlife concerns and offshore wind. Um, and it's a great place for roundtable discussions for how to address those concerns. Um, and while it can sometimes be overwhelming, it's really just a great place to learn about how much work is being done to protect our resources as we um, build a clean energy future. Um, and then the other reason I want to bring this about is that they have um, developed through the um, technical working group a stakeholder driven engagement process. So this eTwig as we call it, brings together agency employees, so people from um, state and federal agencies, um, representatives from environmental NGOs, and representatives from the industry to help in the decision-making process within the state of New York. So it's a really great way to try and coordinate engagement and make sure that it's moving forward in a way that both works um, and, um, and considers um, our, our important natural resources. So I wanna give you guys an idea of where we are right now. Um, up until a few months ago, this is these are all of the areas that were under consideration for offshore wind in the United States. And generally, the process to create a wind farm in federal waters can take several years. <clears throat> and that's only after areas have been identified to consider for potential development. At several of these touch points um, are opportunities for public comment on the potential lease or BOEM's assessment of the environmental impacts. We push to include the monitoring and mitigation measures that I talked about earlier at all levels of permitting, from advocating for scientifically driven planning processes to ensuring that monitoring plans are incorporating um, uh, construction and operation plans that evaluate environmental impacts properly. Audubon supports policies that increase reasonable protections for birds as part of this process, and it's actively advocating to regulate environmental monitoring <clears throat> that assesses actual project impacts instead of simply assessing project sites for species present. So that's been kind of the status quo, is that these projects will just tell BOEM which birds are there and make kind of a risk assessment based on that. And that's not good enough for us. We wanna make sure that they're doing monitoring that actually tells us what the impacts are 
So through that multi-year process, you end up going from um, a call area. This is just using the New York bite as an example because it's it's almost completed its process. So going from the um, New York bite call area to those greened wind, wind energy areas. So the environmental review process and the stakeholder process and the comment period process led us to those smaller green areas. Um, those two green areas at the top, these fairways north and fairways south were removed completely from consideration. Um, and so that took us down to this, these six lease areas that are now um, uh, about to be leased. So um, as of uh, just a few weeks ago, actually, um, New York has decided, or Boehm has decided to move forward with the actual leasing process. So developers will start bidding on them and, uh, and each one of them now knows within their lease stipulations that they're gonna have to put a modus tower in each of these areas prior to construction. In Louisiana, you guys are pushing hard for some, um, for clean energy goals that um, lead us to, um, that, would, that would pull from offshore wind, right? So, um, Back in 2020, um, the governor voiced to Boehm that the state was very interested in procuring offshore wind. Um, and so there was a study in the Gulf of Mexico to see how viable that might be. And that has led to a number of 600 megawatts of offshore wind that seem to be part of this study. And they were, it, they were doing what was called a feasibility study where they're really looking at the economic feasibility and less the environmental um, potential or environmental impacts. Um, they've drafted a, they've recently drafted a climate action plan that uh, is setting the state of Louisiana up to meet, uh, to reach a net zero emissions target by 2050. Um, and your very own city of New Orleans has um, ordered Entergy to cut its emissions. So by 2050, it's supposed to be producing only clean energy. Um, and, and so that's gonna have to come from somewhere, right? We can't meet these targets without getting clean energy somewhere. Um, and the Gulf of Mexico is moving forward with um, the BOEM, I should say, the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management, the federal agency, is moving forward with um, offering leases within the Gulf of Mexico. It's not at that stage yet. It's certainly not at the leasing stage. It's right at the beginning. So uh, last year, um, they, uh, BOEM put forward a request for information asking for any information that might be important to incorporate in um, identifying a planning area, an offshore wind planning area. Um, and Audubon submitted comments um, in collaboration with Audubon Texas and Audubon Delta um, and uh, several of our other coalition members. Um, to provide them with information that we felt would be relevant to identifying areas. Um, and within that, we provided some information about areas that needed special consideration. Um, you can tell here, so um, these outlined areas here, um, you've got the central planning area and the western planning area. Um, were what they first sort of brought forward, that they were considering wind in any of these areas, any information about how to identify wind energy areas within here would be helpful. Um, they then um, narrowed that into a call area. We provided comment on that. Um, and it's since been whittled down into a, um, and it's, it, sorry, we're waiting now to hear about the wind energy area. So the call area is this red outline space. Um, and you can see 
this really important area right here is still under consideration for development, which we're not super thrilled about. So we uh, have provided that in comments. Um, and, and we've certainly incorporated um, comments on the sensitivity of the shoreline, the need for horizontal drilling. And horizontal drilling is a directional drilling is something that would go underneath the surface so that you're not disturbing the topsoil. It doesn't mean there aren't any impacts. It just means that there's fewer impacts to the surface. Um, so this area um, is then going to be whittled down further into what is called a wind energy area. Um, if you go to BOEM's website that I've put right down here at the bottom, um, you can get a little bit more information about where they are in the process. Um, you can get some information on when their next task force meeting is. It's going to be in February, but I don't think that they've actually provided a registration link for it yet. Um, but we're going to continue to be involved in this process to make sure that there's an outcome that we're happy with. Um, when they announce the draft wind energy area, they generally also announce an intent um, to develop a um, environmental assessment. So right now we're in a comment period for the notice of intent to draft an environmental assessment. So this is them just telling us they're about to draft one. Is there anything they'd like us to, is there anything that we'd like them to include? or consider in that environmental assessment. Now that environmental assessment does not actually look at the impacts from building those leases. It only looks at the impacts of leasing and characterizing those areas. So any activity that would, that would be done in order to assess the site so like putting the meteorological buoys out is an impact, you know, is something that would create an impact. Um, we are in the process of having conversations with BOEM about how silly that sounds <laughs> and why they need to actually consider impacts from building the leases when they're considering where they would have leases, right? Like it's silly to not consider that full process when they're identifying wind energy areas and sites for potential leasing. So that's sort of a, um, a weird thing in their um, process. It doesn't follow the same process that they have for oil and gas. And so we're pushing them pretty hard on that. Now with all of our engagement, even though we haven't made you know, we haven't made all of the changes that we want to, we're still pushing. Um, there have been quite a few successes. That most recent one, of course, was the, um, was adding the MODIS towers, the, the telemetry receivers. Um, but I also want to um, just drive home this, um, another win from our engagement in New York. There is something called the Regional Wildlife Science Entity now that is being stood up it was an effort by New York and Massachusetts to, um, and various other partners and NGOs and state and federal agency partners to address the needs to understand interactions between the natural environment, the wildlife and offshore wind development. And it is a direct result of a stakeholder driven technical working group that Audubon participates in. Um, my supervisor is on the steering committee for the regional wildlife science entity. Um, and uh, in case anybody is interested, they are looking for a new name because while they were started up in Southern New England and New York Bight, they are uh, hoping to, you know, incorporate research from all, um, from all regions. And so we'd really like to update the name so it, it <laughs> takes on that characteristic. <laughs> um, another wind, uh, another wind, excuse me, Wendy had brought up, um, offshore wind in the Great Lakes. And with our involvement, Audubon's involvement in the Great Lakes um, and our advocacy up there, we were able to get collision detec detection technology as a stipulation in their um, permit 
So that project cannot go forward until um, it is able to incorporate collision detection technology. And that is really driving forward the um, development of that technology so that it can be incorporated into the project. And I think without that, um, without that fight and without that stipulation with the, within the state of Ohio, we wouldn't have, we wouldn't be at the stage that we are in developing that um, important technology. Um, and keep in mind that any time that you are fighting for the Migratory Bird Act or bird protections in general, you'll, you're helping to create um, a renewable energy industry that's more responsible and, and cited and operated better for birds. So the fact that we were able to reverse the um, rule from the last administration on the Migratory Bird Treaty Act that took away protections from incidental take is huge. That is a big win, and it means that developers are responsible for any incidental take that happens. Our influence has also helped to make sure that the Biden administration is thinking about environmental impacts. So you can see even in their um, goals um, for responsibly developed energy, they are considering um, incorporating the need to incorporate protections for biodiversity, and that includes birds. And we've also, this is a lot of text on one slide, but um, these are all just changes to the um, Vineyard Wind One project that are um, in response to our comments. And we've also been fortunate to raise uh, $75,000 to fund a seabird tracking project. Granted, these are not, um, these are Gulf of Maine seabirds, not Gulf of Mexico seabirds, but that's what's, this is what's possible with um, our membership. You know, we have really um, a powerful voice in our membership and, and are able to really generate um, what we need in order to learn what we need. This is, this is really just driven by a few concerned donors that pulled support for a PhD student um, out of our seabird project um, or seabird institute so that we could track movements of seabirds that nest in the Gulf of Maine. So just to get at how you guys can help specifically, um, you know, if you have questions, you're welcome to email me. You're welcome to email our clean energy um, team. Um, but I'll generally be the one responding to you because I'm the one who's responsible for uh, your region. Um, and if you're interested in getting involved specifically on um, a project or a comment period, please reach out to um, Audubon Delta, reach out to Eric. Um, and, you know, he and I have been working really closely together on how we respond to these projects, making sure that, you know, I'm incorporating um, any issues that might be in Louisiana that I wouldn't have thought of. <clears throat> um, so, and, and let me know if there are issues that, um, you know, that you don't think I've mentioned, right? That if there are issues with specific birds um, of concern or with, just types of concerns that maybe I haven't mentioned today. I can also share with you the comment letters that we have provided to the feds during these comment periods so that you can check them out. And if there's anything I'm missing, you know, let me know. Um, and then keep advocating for local and state policies that help to ensure, um, you know, positive outcomes from renewable energy. So thank you for your time and uh, and for listening to me. I really appreciate it for sticking with me through this long presentation. I